So when we're talking about <coughs> pseudorandom quantum states, we will try to understand the feasibility of this object. Uh, we will look at variants of uh, uh, this, uh, this concept, and we'll also see how pseudorandom states are useful for cryptography. Uh, and this is uh, in joint work with Talita Gulati, who's my student at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, Lovin Ken, who's from Boston University, and Henry Yun from Columbia. Okay, so I need to explain what pseudorandom quantum states are. Um, informally speaking, pseudorandom quantum states are states uh, that are uh, efficiently computable and they're computationally indistinguishable from hard states. So let's try to unpack this. So we require that uh, you know, the pseudorandom quantum states are efficiently computable, which means that there is a, a PRS generator, which is a quantum polynomial size circuit that takes as input a classical string uh, of length lambda, and it outputs a quantum state uh, on n qubits. Okay. Um, so in terms of notation, whenever I use the notation n PRS, I just mean that the output length is n. The input length will always be lambda. So this is the first property we need. The second property is the pseudorandomness property, which states that the output of the pseudorandom uh, state generator should be computationally indistinguishable from uh, the hard distribution on n qubit states. In fact, uh, we need something stronger. Uh, so given the no-cloning property, uh, if you just have one copy, you cannot produce multiple copies, right? So you need to uh, consider a stronger security definition where even given multiple copies of a state, of a PRS state, it should be computationally indistinguishable from multiple copies of a hard state. And how many copies we should allow for any arbitrary polynomial number of copies? Okay. It's important that this is parameterized by for all polynomial in the security parameter, because if you fix this, fix the number of copies the adversary can get ahead of time, then it results in a, a, a slightly incomparable notion called a state design. Uh, that you might already be familiar with. Okay, okay so this is, uh, this is what pseudorandom quantum states is all about. Why do we care about it? Um, so it turns out that pseudorandom quantum states are really useful uh, for in, in many areas. Uh, for example, there's a work that shows the connection of pseudorandom quantum states with the Susskind's uh, wormhole growth paradox and also the ADS CFT correspondence. It is also used to show some uh, space complexity lower bounds in quantum machine learning. Uh, it is also of interest uh, for com quantum complexity theorists. Um, so given this, uh, you know, the first question you need to ask is, you know, it's useful, but can we even construct it? And it was shown in, uh, in 2018 that you can construct this object from uh, one-way functions. And uh, so this, this construction was subsequently improved uh, in a couple of works by Brecker, Skinner, and Okay. So what is a one-way function? So if you're not from cryptography, a uh, one-way function is a function that is easy to compute uh, and hard to invert. You know, meaning that given an input, there is a, a deterministic polynomial time algorithm that computes the output. But at the same time, if I give you the output, uh, an efficient algorithm will not be able to recover the pre-image of this output. Okay, uh, and why do we care about one-way functions? Uh, it turns out that one-way function is, is a fundamental primitive in cryptography. Uh, most of the primitives that you are aware of probably imply one-way functions. So in some sense, one-way functions is sort of necessary for the existence of cryptography. And uh, so this, this work uh, by Ji Liu and Song in 2018 shows this uh, nice result that you know, from this minimal assumption of cryptography, you can construct uh, pseudorandom quantum states. But despite these results, there's still a lot more to be explored uh, in pseudorandom quantum states. For example, it's not even clear whether the existence of PRS requires computation assumptions. Right? So this is something that has not been investigated so far. Um, and also to come up with constructions where the generator circuit is uh, efficient. You know, by efficiency, I could mean low depth complexity, you know, maybe optimize the number of T gates and so on. So this is in terms of constructions and applications. You know, uh, one area where, where it has not been explored is cryptography. You know, it's sort of going to say it seems like a cryptographic object, but the applications of PRS to cryptography was not explored before. So in summary, there's a lot more to be explored in PRS, and uh, we take a baby step uh, uh, in, in this direction. 
Okay. So we show uh, many results. So firstly, we look at uh, we want to understand the feasibility of PRS under what conditions uh, does uh, PRS exist. Uh, so we establish a parameter range uh, for output lengths for which we require computation assumptions to, to construct PRS. And we also revisit existing constructions of PRS and sort of simplify them uh, uh, in a more modular way. And we look at other uh, pseudo-randomness notions uh, in the quantum world. So we look at uh, a notion called pseudo-random function-like quantum states. Uh, so if you're familiar with pseudo-random functions, this is sort of the quantum analog of pseudo-random functions. And we explore the connection between this new object, pseudo-random function-like states, and PRS. Uh, and we show that under some conditions, you can construct uh, PRFS from PRS. And for a uh, more broader range of parameters, you can construct PRFS from one-way functions. And this is what we show. And uh, in terms of applications, we show that many, many interesting primitives uh, that are implied by one-way functions can be constructed from sort of random quantum states. Okay, so I should mention that there is a very nice work by Morimi Yawakawa, who also explored uh, the applications of PRS to cryptography. Okay, so let me jump into the results in more detail. So let's start with the feasibility of PRS. Uh, so we show that if you have a PRS with output length larger than logarithmic in the, in the input length, which is, a, which is a lambda, then you need computational assumptions to construct uh, pseudo-random quantum states. And this is in some sense tight because uh, it was shown that uh, for some uh, uh, constant c, c uh, you can construct a PRS with output length c times log lambda uh, information theoretically. So, um, so this is sort of the best, log lambda is sort of the best you can do uh, if, if you care about information theory constructions. And we also uh, revisit the construction of PRS from one-way function, and we give a simpler proof of this, uh, of this uh, construction. Okay. So the next thing I want to focus on is to understand the, uh, come up with like uh, new notions of pseudo-randomness. Uh, as I said, like we introduced this object called pseudo-random function-like states. Okay. So why do we, why do we introduce this new, new object it turns out that it is sort of difficult to use PRS to build uh, cryptographic applications. Uh, and there are two difficulties uh, that, that, are, uh, that exist. The, the first difficulty is that if I give you a PRS and I ask you to generically transform this PRS into another PRS with a larger output length or a smaller output length, then it's sort of difficult to do. Uh, if you're familiar with pseudo-random generators, there are like generic constructions to do this. But as, long, as, as soon as you have the output to be quantum, this, this seems like a difficult thing to do. The second thing is that uh, the output qubits of PRS tend to be highly entangled, which make it difficult to be used in uh, cryptographic applications. So what is this object of uh, PRFS? Um, I, just like a PRS, you again need an efficient uh, quantum polynomial time circuit which takes as input a key k, and additionally also takes as input x, and outputs a state that is parameterized by x. So the way to think about it is that this, this generator f can be used to generate multiple uh, PRFS states using the same key k. Whereas in a PRS, you can only use a key, a, a key k to generate a single state. And I use the terminology ND output uh, PRFS to denote the fact that D is the input length and N is the output length. Right? So X is a D bit string and uh, psi X is an N qubit state. Okay, and, and in terms of security, what I want is that if I give you many copies of many P, uh, states, PRFS states, then they should be computationally indistinguishable from many copies of IID Haar states. Okay. Um, so here, again, you need the, the property that for every polynomial in, in lambda, uh, the computation and distinguishability should hold.
Okay, um, and what we show is that if you consider PRFS with uh, logarithmic input, then you can construct PRFS from uh, any PRS. On the other hand, if you allow the input length to be arbitrary, then you can construct PRFS from one of functions. Okay. So we have two constructions of PRFS. Okay, so let me now focus on the cryptographic applications of pseudo random states. So recall that one way functions is this fundamental primitive in cryptography. Most of the interesting primitives uh, imply the existence of one way functions. So now you can ask if one way functions is the fundamental primitive even in quantum cryptography. Is it necessary you know, to construct quantum primitives? Uh, if you have quantum resources, then you know, is one way function even necessary, right? And interestingly, there's a work by Kreshmer who showed that there is a, an oracle with respect to which PRS exists, but one-way functions doesn't. So this gives evidence that perhaps pseudorandom quantum states is a weaker assumption than one-way functions, which gives evidence to the fact that perhaps one-way function is not the, uh, the fundamental primitive in quantum cryptography. Maybe there are weaker objects. So what we show is that we, we look at all these uh, primitives, like encryption schemes, signatures, commitments, which are fundamental cryptography, which are implied by one of functions. And we construct these objects from pseudo-random quantum states, yeah. which um, could be potentially weaker than uh, one of functions. Um, so one sort of disadvantage with constructing uh, these primitives from pseudo-random quantum states as against one of functions is that now you need quantum resources, perhaps the communication channel needs to be quantum and so on. But in a follow-up work, we show that, uh, in fact, like even if you're building it from sort of random quantum states, you can get the same sort of benefits that you would get from building from one-way functions. For example, we show how to uh, construct these primitives with just classical communication channels. Yep. Okay, so let's dive into the technical details uh, a bit. Let me start with the feasibility of PRS. Um, so let me first tell you, you know, why is it the case that uh, logarithmic output PRS requires computational assumptions? Okay. So what we show is the following. So if the output length is anything larger than logarithmic in, 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 uh, uh, in lambda, then there exists an adversary who is potentially computationally unbounded that given enough number of copies can distinguish whether it is given a PRS state or a hard state. Can, uh, we can distinguish the probability at least one third. Okay, so it's important that the, the adversary is computationally unbounded. Okay, so the first observation is that uh, with overwhelming probability, the output uh, a PRS state is, is going to be almost pure, meaning that there exists some pure state such that the trace distance between the PRS state and the and this pure state is is uh, is going to be very small. And the proof is very simple. It's just a simple swap test. If I give you two copies, you know, uh, you know, you, if, if the PRS state is not almost pure, then you can distinguish from two copies of a pure hard state. Right. So uh, for the rest of the proof, I'm going to sort of make a simplifying assumption that the output uh, a PRS state is always pure, and the analysis can be suitably generalized in the case when it is almost pure. Okay. So in order to prove this, let me give you two facts. The first fact is that if you look at the subspace spanned by all the T copy PRS states, then the dimension of the subspace is at most root to the lambda. Why? Because there are really at most, uh, there are really two to the lambda number of keys, which means that there can be at most two to the lambda number of states. So the dimension of the subspace cannot be more than this. Right? The interesting fact here is that this sort of dimension does not depend on t. So no matter how many copies you consider, the dimension is always going to be upper bounded by 2 to the lambda. This is something you need to keep in mind. <laughs> Whereas if you look at t copy hard states, um, the dimension of the subspace, uh, the subspace is uh, popularly called as a symmetric subspace. The dimension of the subspace is uh, denoted by this binomial expression. OK? So as I said, uh, the in the first uh, equation, there's no dependence uh, on t, whereas in the second equation, uh, the dimension does depend on t. 
So by suitably choosing T, we can create a gap between these two dimensions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick T to be lambda plus one, and now you have the dimension of the PRS subspace to be at most root of the lambda, whereas the Hart state is going to be at least six times root of the lambda. Okay, so once you create this gap, it gives a natural distinguisher. What this distinguisher does is it takes as input T copies of a state, and then it projects onto the, uh, uh, the subspace spanned by all the T copy PR states. Okay. So there are two cases to consider here. If, in the first case, suppose let's say the distinguisher receives T copies of a PR state, then the projection is going to always succeed. Whereas if the input state was a hard state, you can show that the, the probability that the projection succeeds at most one sixth. Right. So this creates a gap. So this shows that uh, for anything larger than logarithmic output uh, PRS, you need computational assumptions. Okay, so let me move to the second part of the uh, feasibility of PRS. Um, so this is a construction of PRS from one of functions. It's, it's very simple. So here is what I'm going to do. I'm going to create a uniform superposition over all the inputs, okay, uh, uh, n-bit inputs. And then to each term, I'm going to add a phase. And this phase depends on a pseudo-random function. Okay, so f of uh, f is the pseudo-random function. Um, so it's plus the phase of x is plus one or minus one depending on the output of the pseudo-random function. So I want to show that this is a PRS state. So I want to show that if I give you enough number of, even if I give you many copies, then this is indistinguishable from many copies of a half state. The first step towards showing this is to replace this uh, pseudo-random function with a random function. And here I'm going to uh, invoke the security of uh, sort of random function. Um, so uh, any adversary cannot distinguish whether you're given uh, um, access to a pseudo random function or a random function, so I can, I can replace the phase with uh, a random function g of x. So all I have to show now is that this, if, even if I give you many copies of this state, I'm going to call this state binary random phase state. Uh, even if I give you many copies of the state, then this is uh, statistically close to many copies of a hard state. So the trace distance between uh, uh, t copies of binary random phase state and hard state is small. How small? It should be t square over 2 to the n, where n is the number of qubits and t is the number of copies. And um, so this fact was previously shown, but the proof was significantly complicated. So in order to show this, I'm going to um, use the uh, a notion that is um, that might be well known for, for people who work on Haar measure. Uh, it's called permutation invariant states. These are quantum states where which are divided into blocks, such that even if you permute the blocks, the the state does not change. So an example of a permutation invariant state is uh, is what is called as a type T state. Uh, where t is a two to the n dimensional vector which where each component takes values from zero through t okay. so this type t state is a superposition over all the vectors v such that this vector v can be divided into many blocks such that the frequency of of these blocks are going to be the same across all the terms so what do i mean by frequency uh, frequency here denotes the number of times a block is repeated Okay, so uh, you're going to take a, a superposition over all the vectors where the frequency vector is always the same, which is, which in this case is t. Okay, uh, and similarly you can define another notion of states called binary type t states. So in this case, it's defined the same way as before, except that t is uh, now a binary vector and uh, you want frequency uh, vector mod 2 to be t. Okay, so we give a characterization of hard states and random binary phase states in terms of permutation invariant states. So we show that if you look at the distribution of type T states, then it's exactly the hard distribution. And if you look at the distribution of binary type T states, then it's exactly the random uh, binary phase states. Okay. okay, so why are we doing this? It seems like we are rephrasing the problem to be something else. It turns out that uh, understanding the trace distance between the binary type T states and type, st type T states is very easy. Uh, it turns out to be uh, some basic collision bounds. 
So it's easy to bound. So now that we have able to bound the trace distance between the binary type T states and uh, type T states, it follows that you also get a uh, trace distance bound between the hard states and random, random binary phase states. So this, this uh, completes the proof. Okay, so let me now focus on uh, the variant, which is a pseudo-random uh, function like quantum state. Um, so we show how to construct PRFS from PRS. Okay, so the starting point is a PRS state, which is on n plus d qubits. Okay. So I can rewrite the PRS state to be uh, x psi x. Okay. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to post select on the first e qubits to be x. And whatever residual state I get, this is going to be the PRFS state. So all the uh, PRFS states on all the inputs will just be all possible psi x states. More formally, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to first run the PRS generator, and then I'm going to measure the first qubit states. If I get x, I'm going to output the residual state. If I don't get x, I'm going to repeat this process. How many times? I'm going to repeat it 2 to the d times, roughly 2 to the d times, where d is the number of qubits. And this is fine because I'm only interested in, in the case when d is logarithmic in, in lambda, so you're really running in polynomial time. Okay, so now you should ask, why is this, why is the resulting state so random? Uh, so let's say that, you know, we make this assumption that one of the iterations will succeed. Okay, so you'll end up outputting psi x. So we, now we need to show that psi x is hard random. Okay. Um, to show this, we use the fact that any hard state can be written as a superposition or x psi x in such a way that even if I look at all the psi x's, all of them look like they come from the hard distribution. Okay. So using this fact, what I can do is I can first switch, I can first switch the this PRS state to hard state, and then I use this fact to get uh, to show that the output state has to be computationally indistinguishable from hard. So for this argument to work, I made the assumption that one of the iterations has to succeed. But it could be the case that all the iterations fail. Um, and in order to show, in order to uh, argue that this only happens with uh, low probability, I'm going to use another fact about Haar measure, which is that if you look at the, sum of, uh, of the square of amplitudes, all the amplitudes, then they're roughly concentrated around 1 over 2 to the d. So if you repeat this process sufficiently many times, in this case, it's 2 to the d times lambda, then the probability that yeah, you're eventually going to uh, get the first d qubits to be x is going to be very, very high. Okay, not sure how much time I have. So it's... Uh, okay, so I'm going to skip the, the crypto applications, uh, and then I'm going to finally uh, summarize. So we show uh, in this in, in these two works that you if you have a PRS with output length larger than logarithmic in, this, in lambda, you need computational assumptions. And we also come up with a simpler proof of uh, binary phase PRS. Um, we also try to understand other sort of random notions in the quantum world, and we come up with constructions of these other sort of randomness notions. Uh, I didn't have time to talk about it. We also construct uh, uh, some interesting cryptographic primitives from sort of random quantum states. Okay, what are the main open problems? So the current constructions of pseudo-random quantum states uh, are as, assume the existence of one-way functions. But it's not even clear whether you need one-way functions to construct these objects. So it would be interesting to understand whether there are weaker assumptions from which you can construct pseudo-random quantum states. Um, so for example, we can look at candidates that are inspired from random circuits and maybe try to extract a computational assumption out of it and see if we can construct PRS from it. That would be one one such direction. And another direction is to you know understand how PRS with different output lengths are related with each other. Um, as I said, like it's sort of difficult to expand and shrink PRS outputs. So um, you know showing some lower bounds or showing like some generic transformations would be very interesting. So other direction is uh, you know. I assume from the very beginning that you are given multiple copies of a PRS state, but you can consider uh, another notion where you're only given one copy, but maybe the output length is really large. 
you know, so now how is this notion related with multiple copy PRs? Right? So that would be uh, another direction to explore. And finally, you know, what other interesting crypto primitives that you can construct from PRs? So, so that's something, uh, you know, to, to explore as well. For example, if you look at unclonable crypto primitives like quantum money, copy protection, can they be built from PRs? This conclude. Thanks. So given the time, let's take uh, one or two questions. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, I wanted to know, like, do we know some construction to build zero knowledge proof, for instance, uh, from a uh, pseudo uh, random state? Yeah, so commitments imply the uh, zero knowledge proof system. So you get zero knowledge proof systems from PRS. Okay, like you also have proof of uh, knowledge. I mean, you can extract the witness. Oh, you can get so. proof of knowledge. Uh, I would suspect so, but I have to check. Okay, thanks. Typically, you can go from commitments to zero, like zero knowledge proof of knowledge. So, yeah. Okay, so one, the last uh, final question. So are you sure that uh, some complexity assumption is necessary for pseudo-random state generators? But Kretschma already showed that BQP is not equal to PP is necessary for pseudo-random state generators. So how how they are related with each other? What two are related with each other? Uh, so you showed that uh, some complexity assumption yes. is necessary for pseudo-random state generators. Yes. But Kretschma already showed that BQP is not equal to PP is necessary for PRSG, so... So that in and of itself doesn't mean that uh, information theoretic PRS uh, uh, doesn't exist. That's the first thing. Second thing is that I don't think uh, in Krishma's result, the output length was very well defined. I mean, in fact, like, it has to come up somewhere, right? Because if you, if the output length of PRS is slightly less than logarithmic, you get information theoretic construction. So it wouldn't be captured in his result. So this was not very clearly specified in his result, and we make it more concrete in our work. So, so you mean Kritschmann's result cannot be extended to small output lengths, PRSG? Uh, small, sorry? Small output lengths, PRSG. Small output length PRSG, so what's the question? Uh, so his result cannot be extended to small output. Yes, that's right, exactly. Yeah. But in that case, maybe if output length is logarithmic, uh, you can use uh, tomography to make a quantum state to classical case. And maybe in this case, you can show that if QCMA is equal to PQP. So uh, even if you do tomography, that doesn't violate total randomness because you can do the same thing for her as well. The, just the fact that you can do tomography doesn't violate the pseudo randomness property. Uh, yeah, so, so, so I mean, if output is logarithmically small, then first the adversary can do shadow tomography to get uh, classical data. And then uh, this uh, adversary can send query this data to QCMA Oracle to... Yeah, maybe you can come up with Oracle separation, which is what you're suggesting. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Okay. So let's thanks uh, Pavanjan again. <laughs>